Hi there, here's the material for chapter 6, and it is all the material that you are going to need to know about immunity, specifically for patho. So chapter 6 talks about the innate defenses. What we're going to focus on primarily from the chapter material is going to be inflammation. And here are your chapter 6 objectives. There are only three figures that you're going to have to focus on. 6-2, uh, 6-3, six, six, that is looking at the process, the point, the outcomes of inflammation. Then you're going to want to be very familiar with table 6.1. This is a review or a summary table for innate and adaptive immunity. And then figure 5, or sorry, it should be 6. 6.9 is going to look at the four steps of phagocytosis. So, immunity can be broken down into three different lines of defenses. First line, second line, third line. The first line is referred to as innate immunity. In table 6.1, it um, calls it barriers. And really, the first line and the second line are going to be found within innate immunity. Those are defenses that you were born with. And right now we're going to spend just a little bit of time on uh, uh, table 6.1. So hopefully you have a copy of that or you're looking at it in the textbook right now. But you can see the two diff or the three different uh, columns, the barriers, innate, and then adaptive immunity. So things that you want to be aware of is really everything above memory or memory and above. So the level of defense, the timing of defense, specificity, the different cells, which is going to be just kind of in general, and then memory. So with the first line of defense, as they have it laid out here, those are your barriers. And obviously that's going to be the first line of defense. And it's going to be constant, assuming that, say, you have skin on you. That should always be there. It's going to protect you. Specificity, it is broadly specific. So I've mentioned this in micro in terms of the broad specificity that you would see in the first and second line of defense. All right, you have cells there that are going to recognize LPS. Hopefully, you remember that LPS is found in gram negative organisms. When it comes to that broad specificity, a particular type of cell, a macrophage, say, um, which would be in the second line of defense, is going to recognize LPS. But it's not going to recognize if that LPS molecule came from E. coli or Salmonella or Shigella or Pseudomonas aeruginosa. Doesn't care. It just knows that it is LPS and it's going to lock on to that. So no specificity or broad specificity with the barrier. And the cells are going to be your epithelial cells. Any cell that comes into con any cell that is exposed to the surface or to the environment, so your skin, your mucous membranes, those are going to be the cells that are involved. Your microbiome. All of those organisms that live on you and inside of you, those are also going to be part of your barrier defense. And then there's no memory. All right, These cells are just there to protect, to act as a barrier. There is no memory, no response involved. All right, the innate immunity, second line of defense, and it's going to occur as a response to some sort of injury or infection, and a lot of times this is going to be referred to as inflammation. You see that there on the slide with the second line of defense. This response is going to be immediate, so within seconds of something of you having some sort of injury, your immune response is going to start reacting. The specificity, again, broadly specific. LPS, yes, it recognizes it, but it's not specific to a particular species of bacteria. 
And the cells, now you have specific cells that are going to interact with or, or be a part of that process. Mast cells, granulocytes, which are going to be your, your neutrophils, eosinophils, basophils. You have the monocytes and macrophages, which are your professional phagocytes, natural killer cells, platelets, and then endothelial cells. Here you also do not have memory. It's still within that category of the broad specificity, and it's not going to remember if it saw E. coli or Pseudomonas three months ago. It's still just going to naturally react to LPS. All right, and then adaptive or acquired immunity. This is going to be your third line of defense. This would be Chapter 7, which, again, I just don't think we're going to have time for. And I don't think it's going to have time for it at all. So we're just going to skip Chapter 7. But what I want you to still know for this exam is the material in this column. All right, third line of defense, it's initiated when innate immune responses um, signal the adaptive immunity, that process. There is a delay between primary exposure to antigen and the maximal response. So if you remember the nice graph of your antibody responses, where you have the primary exposure, you have the small um, a curve of line and the level of the antibodies drop down close to uh, zero then you have that second exposure and you have a higher curve and that curve never gets back down to baseline All right and that uh, delay could be somewhere be between 7 and 14 days now this response is very specific so sticking with the LPS model now a B cell or a T cell, those cells that are involved, are going to know specifically if that LPS molecule came from E. coli, if it came from Pseudomonas, if it came from um, a variety of different species or strains of Pseudomonas. So the cells that are involved, T cells and B cells, those are the main players. Macrophages and dendritic cells they're in that list because they're going to act as um, um, signal cells to the B cells and T cells. And is memory involved? Yes. So this is adaptive. It adapts over your lifetime. You acquire it over your, la over your lifetime. And you're going to have specificity. So... Be familiar with this in case you have some sort of um, set of matching questions that would have you map out or match the first, second, or third line of defenses. All right, so first line looking at the physical and mechanical barriers. You guys can read this um, just as well as I can, but it's going to be skin. It's going to be the linings of the GI, the genital urinary tract, the respiratory tract, all of those mucous membrane areas. And the mechanical barrier, sloughing off of cells, your skin cells rejuvenate, the old stuff falls off, majority of the dust in your house because of you living in there and your cells sloughing off, right? It takes bacteria cells with it. You have coughing and sneezing, which removes material from your respiratory tract. Um, flushing of the mucous membranes, urine flushing bacteria out of the genital urinary tract, vomiting, and then mucus and cilia that act to protect your body. All right, biochemical barriers. These are also barriers, but it's going to be... Uh, chemicals that are found in saliva, in tears, earwax, sweat, mucus, just helps to try to keep the numbers of invading organisms down before they can get into high numbers and then find a way to surpass those barriers. All right, now on to inflammation. Um, inflammation is generally a good thing. When it is in control or when it's a controlled process, 
it is a good thing. Causes are going to be um, a variety of causes. It can be infection, it can be mechanical damage, ischemia, temperature changes, um, even such things as radiation. And remember, or the thing to remember with inflammation is there is a vascular response. So you have a picture of the vascular bed here, capillary bed, arterial, venule, and you have these occasional lymphocytes or residential macrophages. You have an event that causes inflammation, and the process begins with vasodilation, increased blood flow, and you can see the difference in the size of the arterial here, uh, expansion of the capillary bed, uh, leakage of plasma proteins, that's going to cause your oncotic pressure to decrease. Fluid's going to move out into the tissue. You have leukocyte neutrophil or leukocyte uh, recruitment and migration out to the tissue for you to have that response. Now, the goals of inflammation is to limit damage, control the spread of infection if it's actually due to an infection, initiate the adaptive immune response, and then to promote healing. Now, this figure here, um, kind of a repeat of the figure before, just gives you a little more detail. Uh, inflammation should be a helpful event. Right? If it's acute inflammation, the cause or damage occurs very quickly. Inflammation begins. Inflammation does its job, and the process stops. And this is very helpful because you have limiting damage, you have um, healing that is promoted. In some cases, inflammation can become chronic, and then there are issues. If you have chronic inflammation in the joints, in the GI tract, at the skin, any given tissue, it's not helpful. Processes that allow for a result in inflammation, again, you have the vasodilation, vascular permeability, cellular infiltration, thrombosis, and stimulation of nerve endings. And so you have the erythema, you have the warmth, you have edema that can occur, you have pus that will develop, and pus is generally just dead cells. You can have um, clots that occur, which is generally a good thing. And then because of all this extra stuff that's going on in the tissue, the inflammation or the um, increase in fluid, it puts pressure on the nerve endings and you can have some pain. But again, all of this is to lead up to limiting the damage, control the spread of infection, initiate the adaptive immune response, and to promote healing. All right, phagocytosis. This is the last slide of chapter six. And the figure legend for this figure does a really good job of explaining the processes that are going on at each place. In figure A up here, right, you've got the big picture. You have a splinter here that has caused damage to the tissue, and it has inoculated the tissue with bacteria, these yellow rods here. All right, remember there is a vascular response, and this is going to be driven by chemotactic factors, the red dots here. Those are produced by the initial damaging event, and those chemotactic factors induce vasodilation. All right, they induce ultimately this vasodilation, increased cap capillary permeability, and then with that increased capillary permeability, you have the neutrophil cell and the cellular infiltration. So you've got keep this word chemotaxis here. You should have heard this already. It's the movement towards a chemical signal. That's the chemotactic factors. All right, uh, moving on quickly. Uh, phagocytosis, you have four phases or four steps here, recognition and adherence engulfment and uh, formation of the phagosome, fusion of the lysosome to form the phagolysosome, and destruction or killing of digestion. And if you were to see this question on the exam, these are the four steps that you want to remember.